Introducing our first speaker, he's a guy who really doesn't need very much introduction at this conference. He ran this conference for several years. Uh, Julian Marsden is an emergency doc at St. Paul's Hospital. He's been there for a quarter century. That sounds better than 25 years. Uh, he also works clinically at uh, Mount St. Joseph's Hospital in Vancouver General Hospital. He's the clinical director of the BC Patient Safety and Quality Control Council and a clinical professor in the UBC Department of Emergency Medicine. Uh, he co-leads the Knowledge Translation Initiative there, and he's the, leading the clinical support tools component of the recently launched BCEM network that Jim Christensen was talking about the other day, and Julian is going to enlighten us on CHF. Uh, thanks, Brian. Let's get some water. So welcome, and uh, thanks for being here. I uh, want to say that I was actually uh, born um, at St. Paul's, and uh, my son was born at St. Paul's, and hopefully I'll die at St. Paul's. That's my, that's my goal in life. Um, but they're, they're tearing it down, so I may not make it. Um, well, hopefully I won't make it the next seven years. So uh, it's my pleasure to talk to you about uh, CHF update, uh, Drowning Inside. Uh, I first actually want to start by congratulating uh, Rob and Sandy, who put on another amazing conference uh, and uh, 15, 15 years, and it's been getting stronger and stronger, so congratulations to Rob and to Sandy, who's not here, but. <laughs> so I have um, very little to disclose. Uh, the only thing I could think of was this Tech for Home research, um, which I'm a subcommittee member on. It's uh, to do with home uh, monitoring for heart failure patients. So uh, that's uh, run by Kendall Ho and Chad Kim Singh from VGH, but it, uh, it's also being run at St. Paul's in Kelowna uh, General. It, uh, it involves TELUS, so they, uh, they may have some interest in it commercially, but uh, I don't get any of that. I don't have anything to uh, disclose for commercial support. I wanted to also uh, drum up support. Uh, you already he heard about the uh, BC Emergency Network a couple days ago from Jim. And uh, I just want to put a plug in it for, for it as well. And so please go to the bcemergencynetwork.ca uh, and help us make it strong and um, contribute, look at it, uh, critique it, and also um, you know, make discussions about uh, what's going on on the site and get involved in clinical resources for, for people who are actually in practice on your shift. You can use the, the uh, material. Uh, you can get involved in research and innovation and be part of building that up further than where it's at now. And uh, CPD as well as uh, coming soon, hopefully soon, real-time support. So my objectives are to um, outline the relative value of the evaluation for heart failure, to describe priorities in treatment, and to talk a little bit about the Ottawa Heart um, Failure Risk Scale. So I want to start by giving a little bit of a disclaimer. Uh, I'm not going to talk about CHF because CHF is chronic heart failure. Um, and I'm going to talk about acute heart failure, and that's more of the terminology that's being used, acute heart failure or acute decompensated heart failure. And there's no really good definition out there, but uh, the best one I could find was uh, new heart failure or known heart failure that um, develops heart failure signs and symptoms resulting in a need for urgent therapy. So why is this talk important? Well, the uh, Heart and Stroke, uh, Canadian Heart and Stroke Foundation says that heart failure is on the rise in Canada, that 600,000 of us uh, deal with this, and 50,000 uh, 50, of us will get uh, heart failure diagnosed in the next year, that one in two Canadians is affected by this, and that we spend about $3 billion on this uh, annually. So there is some good news. Um, there's a couple of papers, uh, a 10-year study, uh, 97 to 2007 in Ontario, a 32% decrease in incidence, and then another paper looking at the same time frame roughly nationally, there was a decrease about a quarter uh, for mortality at 20, 25% roughly, mortality and hospitalization in the same time period. So whether or not this represents a small subset of uh, patients that did better than what the Heart and Stroke Foundation uh, is aware of, it's hard to say, or whether or not the data is skewed, it's hard to say. But anyway, there are some good news about this. And the other good news is that you and I actually have a role in this, and this came out recently saying that uh, there are indicators of um, mortality was time to ferrosamide. So if they, the cohort here got ferrosamide early, then they did better and had a lower mortality, 2.3% uh, versus 6% if they got it late. 
And so that means that what you and I do in the emergency department when they see them up front does make a difference, and so, that, so that's good. The bad news is because in the back of all this, all of the advances in heart failure have been in chronic heart failure and nothing in acute heart failure in terms of diagnosis and treatment, really. Diagnosis, uh, I can talk a little bit more. But the other thing is interesting here is that drugs really only benefit those with reduced ejection fractions, so the systolic heart failures. The drugs just haven't made any sort of dent in those who uh, live with diastolic heart failure. Um, so that's part of the bad news. The part of the bad news is also that there's no cure. So these unfortunate people will spiral down and ultimately die, and their, their, um, their natural history will, can be quite chaotic. And a subset of them will have episodes where they have to come to you in the emergency department or in your clinic, and uh, that's actually a period of time of vulnerability for these people. They actually, at that time, have about a 15% mortality rate over the next 60 to 90 days. And so that's fairly significant. But when you think of heart failure overall, it actually rate, uh, gets a prognosis close to that of some cancers with 50% mortality at five years. I mean, that's huge, and that has not budged like it has for ACS or from other conditions. So it's a difficult and hard condition that, uh, hard heart condition um, that we're having trouble getting on hold of. Part of the issue is I wanted to present this to you to understand why it's so difficult. And part of this is the pathophysiology, and I apologize for pathophysiology, but I think it helps to understand. So the, up in the left upper corner, left upper quadrant, um, is damaged myocardium uh, causing decreased cardiac output. And, and two responses occur as a result of that. One is a hemodynamic response through the uh, sympathetic nervous system. And the second is a neurohormonal response. And that's through the uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone uh, system and vasopressin and sympathetic system. And so that leads to renal changes and to volume overload. And that actually has then has effects back onto the heart causes more myocardial dysfunction, and there's a vicious cycle. That volume overload also affects the liver, the gut, the brain, and, and lungs, and heart, not just, the, uh, not just the heart. So this volume overload is, is a big factor in all of it chronically, uh, and, but they don't really know what the mechanisms are, and they're di diving deeper. One of the interesting in, in, um, mechanisms or parts of this is that there's a huge inflammatory cycle associated with this, which you wouldn't necessarily think of when you think of heart failure. So they're looking into that as well as, as to how these patients, um, how they can be better treated through anti-inflammatories. So it's a complex disease. It's also made complex by the patients who suffer from this disease. And uh, they, their comorbid illnesses, such as age and uh, smoking history, hypertension, and so on and so forth. So I want to get back to reality here, <clears throat> talk about a case. So this is a real case. It was not my case, um, but I won't tell you whose it was. 69-year-old um, male, this is 7 o'clock at night, so let's pretend this uh, is your case. <clears throat> he suddenly got short of breath, and he tried his ventilator and adjuvant with no uh, relief. He has a past history of COPD, um, CHF, MI a couple times, and he's a diabetic. So after a couple hours, he, uh, he gives up and he calls the ambulance. So they arrive around 9 o'clock. Uh, they find him alert, he's tachycardic, he's hypertensive. His respirate's 30, his O2 sat's 78% on room air. So they quickly um, give him ventilin and adjuvant by nebulizer, and they try to assist his ventilation as they can between nebulizers and put him on oxygen and bring him to you. <clears throat> he arrives in the emergency department. He's pale, diaphoretic. He's clearly working to breathe, but he's alert, oriented, but he's unable to speak in full sentences. Uh, his heart rate's 124, 160 on 78. His rest rate's increased to 40. His O2 sats are 90 on the best oxygen you can give him. And he's afebrile. So you examine him, chest very poor entry at the bases with prolonged expiratory phase. His heart examination, you can't really assess his JVP because he's working so hard to breathe. His heart sounds are hard to hear. Uh, he has no obvious peripheral edema, and his calves are normal. So does this sound familiar? Does this sound like somebody you might uh, walk away from and wondering, is this guy got heart failure? Is this guy got COPD? Is this guy got a PE? Is this guy got pneumonia? Well, it unfortunately happens to me uh, more often than I wish. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what variables can we look at in terms of the clinical exam. And this is uh, a meta-analysis done in, in uh, 2016, uh, Martindale out of New York, and they looked at well, they actually looked at overall 52 studies, and that involved uh, not just clinical exam, but also um, ultrasound and BNP and other things. But 31 studies looked at um, the clinical exam. And basically, at the end of the day, 
no historical or physical exam finding achieves a sensitivity or specificity more than 70% for the diagnosis of acute heart failure. And some signs, such as an S3, JVD, uh, hepatojugular ref um, reflex, um, are certainly specific, but they're not very commonly seen and they're not very commonly reproducible between examiners. So it's not really that helpful. And the bottom line, overall clinical judgment is from the Wang paper from JAMA 2005, where he looked at about, uh, they had about 18 um, studies uh, and 3,700 patients. Their likelihood ratio of taking the clinical exam, history physical, ECG, and X-ray was only a like, positive likelihood of 4.4, so moderate help, and, um, and negative likelihood ratio of 0.4, so not that helpful. So it becomes very difficult to make the diagnosis often in our situations, but it's still a good idea to do the exam, I'm not saying that, but um, don't be too frustrated by it. So back to the case. Uh, he was put on Ventolin, continuous Ventolin by 10 minutes, and he actually got better, speaking in phrases, so uh, he was improving. He was given steroids, Solucortev, blood gas was drawn um, because he was looking sick. He was given Lasix 80 because he wasn't quite sure he could have uh, an exacerbation of heart failure, and a chest X-ray was done. So, um, obviously we're still trying to figure out what this is, and so I want to talk a little bit about natriuretic peptides, just because I like the topic, and I had to find a place to put it in the talk. Um, so this has got a lot of excitement when we started out 10 or 15, uh, 15, 20 years ago when this came onto the scene, and it makes a lot of sense. These are peptides that are found inside the ventricles that are released when there's pressure, increased left ventricular pressure or stretch on the ventricle myocytes. Uh, released and broken down into the inactive NT pro BNP and then the active BNP. And this is why I think it's the perfect drug and perfect uh, test is because when you look at this thing, and I hope you can see it because it took me a long time to cut it out of the New England Journal, um, and I can't read it, but if you get it, you see there's a B type natriuretic peptide released from the left ventricle or, or the ventricle, sorry, and it decreases peripheral vascular resistance as well as increases naturesis and also suppresses the renal angiotensin uh, and endothelial uh, system. So for me, that's like the perfect agent. It would be like the perfect preg test for heart failure. But the problem with it is that it, it is not very specific. And it has been found to be elevated in so many other things that unfortunately coexist with heart failure. So the increasing age, acute coronary syndrome, renal insufficiency and atrial fibrillation, pulmonary hypertension. These are all things that we expect to see in heart failure, or ha heart failure patients often have coexisting. So it doesn't help us. Pulmonary embolism, we want to rule that out when they're short of breath, uh, or anemia, or even sepsis. So unfortunately, it's not specific enough for us to help. And then it's also frustrating because in sometimes when you really want to know the answer now, in say, flash pulmonary edema, it's also not always elevated. So it's unfortunately not a perfect test. So at the end of the day, uh, a lot of uh, time, effort, and money was spent on this, and at this point in time, it's the best use of it is to help rule out heart failure. If at the end of your clinical examination, x-ray, you're still undecided whether or not this could be heart failure, then do it, and it's helpful if it's negative. It's also, I think, and I use it this way, is when I have a heart failure patient, known heart failure patient coming in, and they're feeling more short of breath, I, and we know that they have a BNP level or an NT pro BNP level that I can compare to in the community, I will do a level and see how they're doing to their baseline. Because it does have prognostic value. It is used by heart specialists and, and um, people to help them in terms of oh, long term. But for us in the emergency department, it doesn't help you. And I actually think it's going to be one of the challenges for it is finding a place in our, in our armamentarium, our toolbox. I do think it's actually going to come back a little bit more in favor as we look at risk stratification. But I'll come back to that later. So I want to talk about uh, ultrasound in uh, acute heart failure, bedside ultrasound. So there's a meta-analysis. This is Martindale. Um, again, uh, she, her study, they looked at, it was eight studies, almost 2,000 patients. Positive likelihood ratio of 7.4 and negative likelihood ratio of 0, uh, 0.16. So it's very good at ruling in, very good at ruling out. This is the test. Um, if you have already using it, that's great. If you haven't, this is something you need to do. Obviously, you don't use it in every patient, but when the chips are down, it's going to help. It should help most of the time. This is the study that is actually one of their bigger studies that they incorporated in their meta-analysis, and it's really good. Uh, so I just wanted to concentrate on it for a second. So this is from Italy, lung ultrasound implanted diagnosis, and they had um, seven emergency departments, community and uh, academic. A 1,000 patients, half of them roughly had heart failure and the other half didn't. 
And they asked their 62 clinicians whether or not they thought clinically the person had heart failure, and their sensitivity was actually quite good, and specificity was quite good. So their likelihood ratios was much higher than I, what I quoted you before. So 8.6 likelihood ratio, which is great, and negative likelihood ratio uh, 0.2, which is good. But if you add lung ultrasound uh, to the clinical, it goes off the map. It comes out of the water. Uh, 37.5 likelihood ratio and 0 0.03 likelihood ratio negative. You can't get better than that. So, I mean, I think this is uh, telling. And at the bottom, the value of the chest X-ray is where it was uh, felt before, which is moderately helpful, so 3.9 and, and 0 0.4. So moderately helpful, but not great. So POCUS and ultrasound, po uh, point of care ultrasound is very useful. And if you haven't already adopted it, which I'm sure many of you have, I would encourage you to do so. It still needs clinical context. It's not perfect. There are problems with B lines and other things that are mimics. So you have to take it into clinical context. Um, but certainly, you need a standard, and you need a standardized approach to it. But back to the case. So, focus was not available. Chest X-ray is still cooking. Blood gas comes back. Not good. I don't know what you want to call it: respiratory acidosis, metabolic. All I was going to say is not good. So it's most likely respiratory alcohol, uh, acidosis, sorry. Um, but you know, I don't know with this guy being COPD where his bicarb usually is. Maybe it's around 28 to 30, so there may be other components there too, but whatever. So what are you going to do now? I think your hand is, is, is forced. So you intubate them, ketamine 100 milligrams, rocuronium 100 milligrams, and you get the tube in fairly easily. All things go smoothly. About 10 minutes later, though, he braddies out and goes into a PEA arrest. And about uh, 25 minutes later, uh, he was unsuccessful. All of resuscitation efforts uh, were unsuccessful. <clears throat> His chest X-ray came back during the resuscitation. And uh, I think you can say clearly it looks like heart failure. Um, if you had that beforehand, it would have been uh, useful, although I don't know if it would have changed the course too much. Um, but uh, it did come back too late to help. And, uh, but he's got a mild, it looks like cardiomegaly, and certainly looks like uh, interstitial edema there. And, but there may be a, you, you could say that maybe there's an pneumonia on the left, uh, right side. Uh, hard to say, though. So I want to talk a little bit about resuscitation sequence intubation as opposed to rapid sequence intubation, which is the term <clears throat> coined by uh, Dr. Richard Levitin uh, in the US. And this really, I think, is helpful for the uh, peri-intubation uh, hypotension and, and arrest that occurs about a quarter of the time, they get hypotension, and 3% 3, 3 will actually arrest. So adequately fluid resuscitate them. And this is hard in the heart failure patient, but you could maybe get help from uh, your exam as well as uh, your ultrasound. Consider a presser. And if their MAP is around 60 to 65, you know they're going to run into problems. So give them a little bolus of epinephrine, which is probably the best one to give in a bolus form, and give 5 to 20 microgram bolus push before you intubate them. Make sure you ventilate them as soon as you can because they're already acidotic. Any, any drop in the respiratory rate will uh, make that worse. I wanted to raise this point, which is we all jump to ketamine. And ketamine is a great drug, but even it is a cardiodepressant. We think of it as safe and as actually a stimulant because it releases norepinephrine. But it actually is a cardiodepressant, so use lower dosages. So a quarter or a half the, uh, a milligram per kilogram as opposed to one or two that you would normally shoot for. And that's sort of the key feature I wanted you to take away from this. And then use the maximum dose your, your paralytic, rock uranium or sucks. So 1.6 or uh, 2 milligrams per kilogram per rock for me. And then afterwards, low ventilator, uh, tidal volume, and rapid rate, just to keep the um, respiratory alkalosis, alkalosis going. And then if they can tolerate some PEEP. And assume they're going to arrest. And if they don't, then you can just shake, uh, give high fives and walk out. But watch them closely afterwards, because a lot of them still will. So in this case, the diagnosis is not clear. And he had comorbid illnesses, and the exam was not helpful, and the chest x-ray came back a little too late. And also, I think the fact that the ventilant helped probably was a bit of a problem. But he probably had some COPD, and that probably made it a bit difficult. But I think his treatment also could have been improved. So I want to talk a little bit about that. So his primary problem was respiratory failure. So he should have had a trial of non-invasive ventilation. I think most of us would do this now, um, and perhaps an early intubation if that didn't work. So this, the work that's been done on that, to meta-analysis, uh, Cabrini, uh, looked at 78 uh, randomized controlled trials, and they did their forest plotting. All of it lands on the left-hand side, which is uh, COPD, acute pulmonary edema, also all causes uh, acute respiratory failure. Uh, everything is on the left-hand side. So non-invasive ventilation reduces mortality. 
from 14% versus, if you don't use it, 21%. So it's a significant number, and the number needs to treat as 16 for all comers. And even the Cochrane Collaboration agrees with this. When they looked at pulmonary edema, non-invasive ven uh, positive pressure uh, ventilation reduces hospital mortality and intubation rates. So even Cochrane Collaboration agrees, which is unusual. So uh, um, assuming that we had made the diagnosis of acute heart failure, what next? So the next thing, obviously, is nitrites, nitrates, sorry. And um, the, the literature is not good on this. There's only four studies. Uh, one study was actually uh, the one that they focused on, but it is basically garbage uh, from 2002. And so there's no good data to help any firm conclusions from their point of view, and I would tend to agree. But we all have anecdotal stories of, of patients getting uh, sublingual nitro and coming in, and actually their acute pulmonary edema getting better uh, quite quickly. So, the actual have the Society of Academic Emergency Medicine uh, and Acute Heart Failure uh, group have um, come up with recommendations based on their blood pressure. So if they have a blood pressure greater than 140, go hard with the nitrates. And then think if their volume overloaded, give them diuretics. But think first about non-invasive ventilation if they need it for, for respiratory. And then next thing to think about is vasodilators if they've got pressure over 140. If they're between 100 and 140, then think about either nitrates or diuretics, and again, um, but you can use topically or even IV for that. And then if low blood pressure, then you're probably looking at diuretics plus or minus an inotrope. And then, uh, so vasodilation before di diuresis, and nitroglycerin is, is whatever you go to. The point here is to go high, go hard. So at least 50 to 80 micrograms per minute decreases the preload. You can start slow, low, but get it up fast. And even 100 to 200 micrograms per minute is the range where uh, some people will need at the oh. end. Unfortunately, let's just go back. Unfortunately, um, they develop uh, tolerance to it very quickly. So you've only got a short window there to get on top of the patient on um, heart failure. And then afterwards, just diarrhea slowly. So only one to one and a half uh, times their usual daily dose if you know what it is, or 40 to 80 if you don't. And um, that's what people are now recommending, to not go hard with diuretics and run into problems with electrolytes and stuff. And then give them two hours. If they haven't given 500 cc's of urine, then give them another dose. So who can be sent home? The US has a uh, number quoted of 80% are being admitted to hospital. And in Canada, Ian Steele and company say it's about 40 to 60%. So we do have uh, a high rate of admission for these patients and lots of reasons for admitting these patients. And part of it is we don't have recommendations around who to admit and who to send home. Um, they have studied it, but the, uh, the problems of the studies have been the, all been admitted patients. So in 2013, uh, Ian Steele and company uh, developed a risk scoring system from a data uh, administrative database, and they came up after looking at 559 um, visits at six emergency departments in Ontario and Alberta. Uh, their admission rate was 38%, so on the low end of what we would expect. And I just want to point that out because on the next slide, this is kind of interesting. And about 12% and about serious adverse event, uh, readmission and, and ending up needing intubation and so forth. So the tool is uh, large and will need to be put on your smartphone when it becomes available uh, or on your computer. And um, so various components, I'm not going to even go into them because at this point it's still not ready for prime time. The point here is that this is looking good. Um, when they looked at these variables, and what is also interesting at the bottom there is the NT, Pro, B, and P is on this thing. They included that, but it's not really available everywhere, so they didn't, couldn't include it in all the, um, all the sites. But they came up with a risk score, and if you get above two, so three and more, you're into the high risk, and they want people to use this as, a, as just an add-on to your clinical exam and your clinical assessment, because they're not going to have a, a guideline saying yes or no. They're going to use, want you to just incorporate this into your overall clinical judgment. And so that's how they're pretending, they, they, they're feeling that we will use this. So probably with a one or a two, you will probably decide based on your level of risk and what's going on with the patient, whether or not you will admit that patient or not. They've actually validated it, and so on this year it came out prospectively. It was an observational study in the same centers, and they looked at 1,100 patients from the same six emergency departments. They told the physicians to, to calculate the score, or scale, the risk score, but not to use it in their decision. But of course, um, they must have done because 57% admission rate is much higher than their first cohort. Um, 
but the, the serious adverse event rate was um, only slightly higher. So this looks very promising. And what's also interesting about this is, in fact, that the NT Pro BNP also helps with the risk score. And so, in fact, they found when those sites that actually had, were able to use NT Pro BNP, it actually made the, the test more, the, the scale more sensitive and specific. So it was actually looking like it may have a role there. So, in conclusion, I hope I convinced you that acute heart failure is a very complex and complicated disease, which is why we're having so much trouble getting a hold of improvements in treating this, um, but it is looking quite promising. Point of care ultrasound is important and helps clarify a clinical exam. Tailor your treatment based on a hemodynamic profile, non invasive ventilation if they have respiratory failure is, a, is the first go to, and then vasodilate hard. If, they, uh, if you have the ability to, with based on their blood pressure, and then diuresis judiciously if they have a pretty stable blood pressure. And risk stratification is surfacing soon in a place near you. Thank you. Thank you. Not bad.